Hello, I'm Stephen Colby and welcome to the idea to IPO seminar regarding top five IP mistakes that could derail your startup. I wanna start off by saying that I'm a patent attorney with the law firm of Ramon Law. And by listening to this presentation, it doesn't mean that I've become your attorney somehow. And in order to do that, we have to have an informal engagement letter and uh, an agreement between both of us that I would represent you. Um, and start off today a little bit, uh, tell you about myself. I, as I said, I'm a patent attorney at Ramon Law. I have a history of working with startups. Uh, my favorite thing to do is working with early stage startups. Uh, I, I put it this way, I like to be a big fish in their little pond. I feel that I can contribute more that way. Uh, my history is that I spent most of the 90s as a CTO of a chemical instrument company. So my background is very much as a product guy, as a product manager. I like taking things to market, getting new products out there, selling stuff. Those are the types of things that I enjoy. The goal of this talk is going to be to present to you some, some ideas to keep in mind so that hopefully you'll avoid making mistakes in the future. And if, if I do my job right, I'm gonna save you a lot of grief and, and worry, right? There is a, if you have questions, there is a question and answer uh, input option. And I will look, go through those uh, briefly if I have time at the end of my talk. Uh, probably won't take any questions during the middle of the talk. Great, and welcome. So let's go ahead. So the first question you're gonna ask yourself if you're worried about IP mistakes is, well, what's IP, okay? Um, if you don't know what IP is, you, you're even more likely to make IP mistakes. So in general, there's lots of different IP. IP stands for intellectual property. And that means it's a, your property or, or an asset of your company that involves intellectual ideas, thinking, writings, stuff like that. So the most common types of IP are copyright, uh, trademark, trade secrets, and patents. And since I'm a patent attorney, don't be surprised if I talk more about patents than anything else. So there was a copyright symbol at the beginning of this uh, on my first slide that said copyright 2021. So copyright is something that applies automatically. Uh, the copyright is owned by the producer unless they're an employee and have an employee agreement that assigns their work to their employer. So copyright is something relatively easy to get. You can register copyrights at the uh, with the US government and it's actually the Library of Congress that does copyright registrations. So you can go there yourself and pay what used to be a $25 fee and register a copyright on something that you've written or produced yourself. The registration gives you the power to enforce, but you already own the copyright. If somebody steals your pictures, you can, and you find that your social media website, your family photos are, are being used by somebody else, you can register their copyright on them and then write the host a, a takedown notice, right? For startups, copyrights are often found in things like the, the website, your website should have a copyright statement on it. It's source code should have a copyright and compiled code should have a string that includes a copyright statement. So copyrights can be relatively easy to obtain and manage. You should just be aware that um, they encompass just the writing or the picture or the layout of a website. They don't encompass the underlying ideas behind it. So for example, if you have a copyright on software, somebody could write different software, do the same thing, and, and that wouldn't infringe the copyright, all right? Trademarks are intended to, to represent your products or services, okay? There's famous trademarks. Zoom is a trademark, right? Uh, Ramon Law is a trademark. Uh, Skype, uh, Kleenex, all these types of things that we either associate with brands or services, McDonald's, right? Big trademark. So trademarks have specific purposes and they're confined to specific classes. Unless it's a super trademark, um, like Chanel or something or Xerox, 
your a trademark would be confined to specific services. In other words, there can be two companies, one selling timber and the other selling a social media app that have the same name. And that's not a trademark conflict because there's not a likelihood of confusion between those two products. If you become famous, if you're Amazon or Xerox, then you have rights to, to use your trademark in pretty much any space, right? And there's, it's pretty easy to, to discern, well, between famous trademarks and regular ones. If you're starting a company, one of the things you should do is just do a web search on the name of the company and make sure there's nobody else that's doing the same thing. You can go to the US Patent and Trademark Office website and yourself do a trademark search. You can have a professional trademark search done, which will include alternative spellings, foreign language words, other trademarks, things like that. In most, in the United States, most states give you a common law trademark usage. In other words, if you start a, a company and you put start advertising on the web and put a sign on your front door and advertise in the newspaper, I guess people still do that, um, you'll get an common law rights, which as, as a first user of that mark, give you some protection. A trademark registration is much better protection because that puts everybody else on more clear notice that something's happened. But you can start es establishing trademarks by putting a little TM symbol right after what you consider to be the trademark, whether it's a name or a logo, right? So to protect your trademarks, initially before they're registered, you can use a little TM. After you've registered, you can use the circle R symbol. And that's a per country basis. So if you have a trademark, a product with a trademark registered in the US, you can put a little R, circle R after the trademark. But if you ship that product into Canada, the version that you're shipping into Canada where you don't necessarily have a registration, that in that case, you should be looking at, at, at using just the TM. So trademarks and copyrights are relatively easy to get. With trademark, you need to, to do an initial search. The last thing you wanna do is start a company and put a lot of money into branding and the name only to find out that somebody else has already been using it for a couple of years ahead of you, right? There's a few countries that in which it's a first to file situation. So whoever gets to the their trademark registered first wins, even though somebody else might have been using it first. And the big, the, the most important country in this category is China, where it's trademarks are a first to file system. So once you start getting traction as a US company, before you really expand internationally, you probably want to consider doing a, reg a trademark registration in China if you plan to go in that direction, if you plan to be an international company. So let's go to the number three on our list here, trade secrets. The nice thing about trade secrets is they can be really inexpensive if you do something about them, right? And you've probably all heard about uh, Google suing Waymo and, and Samsung and all these big companies have multi-million dollar trade secret battles in court. One of the things that makes a trade secret really valuable is documenting it, all right? So the thing to do with a trade secret is identify, make a list of what your trade secrets are. Maybe it's an algorithm that you use in your software or your list of vendors or your list of suppliers, or your list of customers. It might be a process step in how you make something. That's the, or how you price things, how you determine your pricing. All those are examples of trade secrets. It could be there's an invention that you decide to keep as a trade secret for some reason. Well, the trade secret is better, more protectable if it's documented and you take steps to protect it and treat it as a secret. That means not everybody in the company gets to know it, right? You've got to keep it a secret. You take steps and you have policies built into your company and so only this person gets to see the trade secret. We have a list of who is, is, has access to each of our different trade secrets. They sign a document acknowledging that they're receiving trade secret information. I also, sorry for the engineer who, who does something at one company and then six years later has a similar problem and goes, 
oh, I solved that before, right? And how is, you know, it's hard to remember, oh, what was a trade script and what wasn't six, 10 years ago, right? So the best way for the company to do that is to put a document in front of the engineer and when he leaves or or it's some when he gets first access to the trade secret and say here sign here this is a trade secret you're going to be given access to and because you sign this document you're getting the no and nobody else is if you have a program in place like that your trade secrets but can become really valuable and actually much more enforceable if you're wishy-washy about oh i thought that was a trade secret but joe didn't then you know, that's a, a big defense in, in a trade secret litigation. And now, number four on our list, we're going to get to patents. And that's what I'm going to talk. A good part of the rest of, of my discussion is primarily going to be focused on patents because I'm a patent attorney and patents are really cool. So let's talk a little bit about patents. First question, what kind of patents are there? Mm -hmm. There's something called a provisional patent application. And the nomenclature established by our government has said that the other type is called a non-provisional. Isn't that creative? Yeah, a provisional and a non-provisional. Other words for a non-provisional are a utility patent application. Uh, it, that's an older term that's been used, but and is still used to refer to a non-provisional. We also have design patent applications. There's others that aren't listed here. There's plant patents. There's patents on semiconductor masks. There's, there's a, whole, a bunch of other types of patents that are really much less common. Um, a provisional patent application is, we're gonna talk about it a little more later, but it's really useful because it gets you to put a stake in the ground. It, it, it's a inexpensive way of establishing what you had at a certain date, right? And gives you a filing date for that content. It's quick and easy. My favorite provisionals are like a scientific paper that's about, or an engineering document that's about to be published. And I can just slap a cover sheet on it and file it as a provisional. It's really inexpensive because it is informal. It can be a slide deck. So I have gotten you know, extensive business plans and slide decks that are about to be handed over to investors, be shown to a VC. And the day before it goes to the VC, it gets filed as a provisional patent application. And that provides you some protection for whatever content was in there, right? Um, so that if whatever you're passing around leaks out and gets distributed in a way you don't want to, you'll, you can say, hey, no, we filed before that date. It's also useful because in many countries, not the United States, but in many countries, you have to file before you make anything public. So if you do a presentation at a, uh, a fund, a Kiritsu forum or some semi-public fundraising event or, or an online event a bunch of, in front of a bunch of investors, that can be, is very likely to be considered a public disclosure. So everything you present and everything behind it is considered to have had public use. And it turns out that um, it's a funny thing in the, in the case law, uh, what happens, so if you demonstrate a, a iPhone app, and all that's being shown on the screen is manipulation of some image or some search or some cool cool features you've got there. There's a server that you're connected to at the back end. Everything that's going on on that server that's actually hidden from view is still considered to be being used in public, even though people can't directly see it, right? And that's a mistake a lot of people make. So if you pre do presentate, present a piece of software or present a device some cool device in public and people can't really see what's going on inside, that still counts as a public use. And, and the case law on this comes from the 1880s where a man invented a new type of, of uh, whalebone uh, braces in his wife's girdle. Yeah, that she wore under her dress, right? And the court said, hey, no, that was public use because the benefit, the shapeliness, the change in shape or was visibly viewable. And so that was a public use of that document. And the person didn't get a patent because they'd used it publicly and hadn't filed it on time, right? So provisional applications have lots of uses. Kind of to summarize, they're a good placeholder. They can be inexpensive and quick and easy 
especially before you're going to do some type of presentation before investors and so on, right? Important thing to remember is they only last for one year. After the year is up, if you haven't done anything else, they go poof, they're gone. Like they never happened, which could be in if you wanted, if you decide you wanted to keep it a secret, it's done. It'll never be published. It's, you know, the patent office doesn't look at them, right? So you can pretty much do, uh, you know, you can abandon it and it, it won't, it'll expire at the one end of one year. But by the end of one year, you have to have filed a non-provisional patent application claiming benefit to the provisional, right? And if that fail, if you miss that date, you're, you're sunk, right? You're, the provisional uh, no longer is gonna count for you. So what happens often is I'll, I'll work with a startup company and they'll file a provisional application and I'll tell them, okay, your year has started. You need to now raise money, get moving, get traction, um, and be prepared to file a provisional application within a year. And then 10 to 11 months later, they come, well, we really didn't do much. So uh, hopefully they didn't do public disclosures and they can just refile their provisional application and restart the clock, right? So those are provisionals. Uh, the, one of the problems with them is sometimes they don't have a lot of content. There's not much meat to them. And if there's not much meat to them, then they're not as good a placeholder, right? They're only as good as actually what's in that document. And so we'll talk a little bit later about preparing good provisionals. A non-provisional is the type of patent application that actually gets examined by the patent office in a process where you go back and forth and argue, they say you're, you don't have the rights to a patent, your claims are too broad, or somebody else has done this already. And your, your patent attorney argues back to them and says, no, patent office, you're wrong. This is the reality, or you narrow what you're claiming. Um, and then after a few years and a bunch of money, the non-provisional application can turn into a patent. And it could also have daughter applications. So you can develop a family of patent application. I'm not gonna get into that now, but um, that's the one that'll actually turn into a patent. The third type here that's pretty common is design applications. That's supposed to be for ornamental stuff, but it can be really valuable. Um, my favorite design applications, which a lot of you are probably familiar with is the uh, Polycom speakerphone. Um, I was at a, a meeting yesterday and there was a Polycom phone on the, on the conference table. It's the triangular shape of that phone. It's kind of cool looking. It turns out that that was um, one of Polycom's most valuable patents in the early days of the company because having the speaker in the middle and the microphones distributed around the, the side turned out to be a really good design in terms of acoustics. So Polycom's early competitors were basically, they couldn't have that nice triangle shape though. So they had this, there was a couple of products out there that looked like uh, um, UFO spacecraft, right? Uh, and they were they did not look as cool on the table, right? So Polycom, you know, that was a really valuable patent that they actually enforce. It's moderate cost, but it only lasts for 14 years. Uh, that's it. So those are the basic types now. I'm gonna to get to the next slide, which is the one I know you're all just waiting for. It's the mistakes, okay? All right, and this is, uh, uh, this is a spider here and her name is Charlotte. And what you don't wanna be is right here, especially your company. Like this is nice green hill. You don't wanna be under, underneath. You don't wanna have this next to your company. You want like, a big sign of dollar bills and champagne and all that stuff. We were, we're gonna discuss the, a good part of the rest of my talk is now gonna be about avoiding being here under Charlotte, all right? So the mistakes that we're gonna discuss are ownership. Ownership, ownership, and you, you, as you're gonna see in a minute, it really deserves to have both the number one and the number two spot, all right? Number three is waiting, that's the timing. Four is a lack of strategy. I'll get into all these in details in a minute. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about understanding the patent because often I have people who really don't understand what the patent does and so on. So we'll cover a little bit of that. And anyway, that's gonna be the rest of our discussion here. So let's start off with number one. Repeat after me, ownership. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, 
First thing you got to remember, you want to own your own IP, right? You don't want somebody else to own it because their ownership rights will come up just at the time you're about to take advantage of your IP, right? They'll come up the wrong time. And you're about to raise money. You're about to do an IPO or have a really great acquisition exit, about to sell to Google for big mega bucks. And somebody comes along and says, oh, I own some of your IP. You're in real trouble. That can be fatal. That's what I call, uh, a friend of mine calls a dead on arrival issue, right? So in the United States, you need to know that ownership initially vests in the inventors, right? Other countries have different laws. And I am a uh, California attorney and I uh, represent, practice also before the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which gives me the right to practice anywhere in the US patent law. Other countries, Germany is different, has different laws. Spain has some interesting laws. China, you have to talk to an attorney uh, or be referred to an attorney in those specific places if that's where you're operating or that's where your employees are operating, right? So they have different laws. So in Spain, for instance, there's much more of a presumption. My understanding is there's much more of a presumption that the company owns the property, right? So in the US, Ownership initially vests in the United States. And in order to move the ownership from the investors to you and your company, what you have to have is some sort of an agreement. Typically, it could be a contractor agreement, right? If they're an independent contractor. So if you're hiring somebody on a, uh, one of these work sites, right? Fiverr or something like that. And they're gonna provide you with images for your website or they're gonna provide you with a company logo. That's a great example, right? You got to read the fine print on that website, and there's little boxes you can check in the in the agreement that you're forming with this person. And you got to check the ones that have to do with IP. If you don't check them, and somebody, some great person in Malaysia, makes uh, a cool logo for you, and you haven't obtained the rights fully, the rights to that logo, you know. Five or six years later, when you're a really big company, somebody's going to buy those rights from that person and give you a headache like you don't aren't going to believe. All right. So the IP that we're all the IP we've talked about, including trade secrets and copyrights and trademarks and, and patents, you need to make sure that you own it. So going back to the agreements, there could be a contractor agreement where you've hired a contractor to design your website you own the rights to that design that they come up with, right? If you hire an engineer and they're gonna do development for you, you're gonna to wanna to own the copyright and you're gonna to wanna to loan any, any other intellectual property, including inventions and, and so on in the product that they produce for you. So if they're an employee, every employee of the company, every advisor, every consultant, every contractor and the founders should all have agreements that assign rights to the company. I've seen a situation where, um, to no fault of his own, a founder was later not available to, um, how do I want to put this? Um, I, I give, when I meet with founders, it, it used to be that I, I would say, well, what happens if one of you gets hit by a bus? And they would always give me this really negative look. And, and so I changed that presentation. And now I say, what happens if one of you meets a billionaire supermodel of the gender of your choice and runs off to Rio, and then they all smile. So somehow, you know, even founders can become unavail unavailable. And it's important that the founders agreement or whatever corporate agreements you have or agreements between founders, that you also have to have a some clause assigning intellectual property. Investors will be really upset if they find out, if they put money into a company and they find out that one of the founders held things back. In the legal uh, profession, we call that um, an investment in litigation attorneys or a lawsuit, right? So it's important that you remember that all, anybody involved with your company, including the founders and the CEO, should have some sort of agreement that transfers ownership from them to a to the entity, to the company, right? All right, now, uh, you wanna make sure um, 
the assignment process is a recording process. So just like if you buy or sell a house, there is a system within the US Patent Office where you record assignments and you can go look there and see ho who owns patents or patent applications. And you'll see who the original inventors were and what companies they assigned it to, whether there are any liens on those assignments, if the companies then transferred it to somebody else. If you're ever gonna license somebody's patent or some technology, you can go look there and make sure the person you're licensing actually owns what they're, they're offering to you, right? So you gotta make sure you own your own IP. That's the number, a number one mistake. And I literally have seen companies three to four years old with millions of dollars invested where all of a sudden they realize that one key person never signed uh, an IP transfer agreement. And that person turns around and says, well, I want 20% of the company. And the company dies. I mean, right there, millions go down the tube because somebody made this mistake and let it go. You know, the CEO didn't want to confront him. I've seen cases where uh, one founder is the godfather of the son of the other, right? They're friends, okay? And then the whole thing collapses because they can't agree on, on IP ownership, right? So get this done really early. It should be a default thing when you first start a company. This should be part of your DNA, right? Making sure that you own your IP. Now, of course, remember ownership is here twice. So the, the second issue is other people's IP. All right. So there's a bunch of different issues here. The first is, let's imagine that you're, you're building a startup, all right? And you want, uh, you're gonna come up with a new product and launch it on that, uh, you know, either sell it at Best Buy or launch it, launch it on an app store. And your question is, well, has somebody done this before? There's a big difference from the startup viewpoint versus established companies. If you're Intel or Google, you don't wanna go poking around and finding that their patents covering what you are doing because that has legal consequences. It means you're, you're intentionally infringing somebody's patents. But when you're a startup, you can go out there and look around and see what other people are doing. And if somebody else has already done or tried it, or if um, you find some a university patent is in your way, or there's a patent that doesn't like look like anything's done with it, you, you have the flexibility at that point, right? You can go to, you know, through a third party to the owner of some patent that's wasting itself on a shelf and say, hey, you know, we'll give you 25 grand for that. And maybe you'll get it, right? So, or if it's a university patent, you can license something from a university that they, they love doing that off, uh, if it hasn't been exclusively licensed to somebody else already. So all those options are there. You have the flexibility. So my recommendation, so my background is as a scientist, right? I was a scientist and an engineer and then became an attorney. As a scientist, I always tell people to read the literature. That means you should know your space, right? If you're in social media, you should know the social media space. If you're in solar technology, you should know everybody who, all the other players in that space and what they're doing especially when you're an early stage startup, because then you can be really flexible. You can recognize, if you read the literature, quote unquote, which means these days, you know, reading postings and blogs by other companies, looking at patents by other companies that are in your space, seeing what they're doing. It's really useful because it can actually give you ideas. You know, it, there will be the time when you read something and go, oh, somebody did this already. I just saw a patent, patent issued patent that really covers everything I wanted to do and it's owned by you know, some by Amazon or Walmart, right? Well, you know what? It's a lot better that you learn this now than two years from now and millions of dollars and you know, hundreds of years of, of engineering live, right? You know, so that's it. When you're going through literature and you find things, keep records, keep a notebook or a log, right? An email log or something. Um, of what you found, because it might be that if you find something similar to what you're doing, you'll at one point have a duty to tell that to the patent office. This is similar, but we're different. Um, you may read the literature and get lots more ideas. You see somebody else, what they're doing, go, ah, if we did, if they had our trick, 
we could put that in ours together and have a great system. And then you file a patent application on that combination and uh, preempt them. I have a great story about IP uh, that somebody told me was that when AMD, the semiconductor maker first started off, you know, Intel was the big mothership on the you know, 90, 900 pound gorilla in the, in the space. And what their engineers did was they would research everything Intel published and their product roadmap and so on. And then they'd get together every once in a while and have these powwow sessions saying, okay, Intel says they're gonna do this. Let's think of all the ways we could do that. And then they'd file, they'd brainstorm and come up with ideas and file patent applications on that. So once they got big enough for Intel to take notice, oh, they had their own patent portfolio that they could fight back. And they, even though they were the little guy, the IP approach that they took really, really helped them. So that's useful, okay. You need to make sure that when somebody comes into your company, they don't bring anything from their previous employers. No computers, no drives, no code. That should be part of their employment agreement. So um, at, at the minimum, they're, they must have signed an employment agreement says they agree and promise not to bring any third party stuff into your company, right? So then when their former employer comes after your company, that gives you your first little bit level of defense. It's not a full defense because you actually have to actively make sure that people aren't adding code or adding something to your, your products. The employee who said, oh, you know, I solved this problem two years ago and I have a copy of that code. So I'm gonna stick that right in here and they're gonna think I did a whole month's worth of work. Boom, you're in real serious trouble, okay? So that should be something that it, your employees are reminded of, your team is reminded of. Um, if you're a planning to be a founder and you are working for a company right now, you need to be that's in any way related to that space. Um, uh, it's uh, tough. Uh, you have to be really careful to make sure you create a clean firewall between what you had before and what you knew about and what you're do doing in the future. And that's part of keeping records, keeping records of who had ideas, meeting notes, who came up with ideas at meetings. And so that if there's ever a question about where something came from, you have a note that says, oh no, at the the weekly meeting back here, Susan Jones came up with this idea and here's the notes and two people have it in their notes, right? That really helps, okay? Um, so that's important. You wanna do this transition and it can be pretty close. Big companies can consider just about anything to be in their space. One of the ones that I remember that I find um, a good example is a good example is a company that was in the entertainment business that may, that sold uh, gaming equipment, right? For video games. And their, one of their top people left to, to form a robotics company, okay? An AI based robotics company. And the original company sued because they said, oh, robotics is our space because we're gonna use robots to assemble our game consoles, right? Um, so be careful, you need to uh, be really aware of what people have signed. If you're bringing employees in, you need to have um, possibly looking at, depending on what their previous employers were, you may ask that your attorneys review their previous employment agreements to make sure there's nothing coming over and what the scope was. And this is also a state by state issue. So if your employee is in California, one set of rules will apply. If your employee is in Florida, another set of rules apply. And then if your employee is in Russia, yeah, entire different set of rules apply, right? So it really can be, especially with, if you have a distributed workforce, you may have to worry about these issues all over the world. Hopefully, you know, you're a US company in this particular state and you can get the laws of that state to apply no matter where your employees are. Um, we're not gonna talk, I'm on the very edge of talking about employment law here, which is a whole nother seminar, right? Um, so one more thing on other people's IP is there's sometimes a temptation to use open source materials. These are uh, materials that can be really high quality because so many people have worked on them and reviewed them. You can use open source material 
but only after your attorney has reviewed the license agreement. Because some sort of open source license agreement require that if you use their product, whatever you make with it is also open source, right? So if you have a cool app or some, some a piece of software that's you know, really successful, and then somebody finds out that you used a bunch of code from some an open source um, resource, and that license agreement says, anything you put this in is also free, and you grant a right for anybody to use it and copy it and distribute it, well, you're really in trouble because you just granted that with all those rights to the entire world, right? So if you're, if you're gonna use open source stuff, and again, your engineers and employees need to be re regularly reminded of this, don't, you can do it, but you have to really understand what kind of agreement or kind of, um, uh, what comes with that, what kind of limitations comes with that product, right? All right, so that was number one, uh, ownership of IP, your IP. And number two, ownership of IP, other people's IP. Now let's move on to yesterday. When do you need to start to think, start thinking about IP? Well, at least you are all here right now, right? So that means that you are concerned about this issue, it's, it's, on your mind, and that's number one step, okay? Um, because there's a lot of people who don't even think about it until they get way along, right? Um, and that can be a real problem. So as I've mentioned before, there's something called a provisional patent application, right? So those are relatively inexpensive, and I'll talk about some costs near the end, right? Those are relatively inexpensive. So really, once you start talking to people, that's the time to get some initial IP protection in, right? That's the time. It's very often I, as a patent attorney that uh, founders will come to me before they even try to, before they talk to a corporate attorney. There'll be two people, uh, two or three people trying to start a company and they'll come to me and I'll say, okay, you, know, you need to have an agreement among yourselves about IP. Uh, it'll be one of your founders documents. You know, we, I'll, introduce them to a corporate attorney who will advise them on different aspects of how to be a, a corporation depending on exactly, or a partnership, depending on exactly what they plan to do. But before they do a presentation for investors, uh, that's the time to get some first filings done. And it, it really is for a lot of reasons because the investors that you're presenting towards may say, do you have any patents for patent applications? And you can say, yes which is good. It sounds like you have your, your acting gear, right? Uh, a provisional application does make something patent pending. Right? Um, you protect the presentation. You know, anytime you present to a group of people, you can assume that there will be some leakage. Most good investors, if they see an interesting company, what they're gonna do is ask their friends who've worked in the similar spaces, what do you think of this one? What do you think of this one, right? And that guy said, well, it looks just like my blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden things are getting muddled, right? So filing before you start raising money, of course, which gives you the chicken and the egg problem, right? So um, the road was first, okay, yeah. Um, the, so get starting with a provisional plan, a provisional filing strategy earlier to raise, and once you raise money, then you can go on and do and do more things, okay? So that was three, number three was when. So before any type of public disclosure, right? Or any type of public use, I would like you to get some initial filings done, right? All right, next item, strategy. Okay, a lack of strategy. This brings us to uh, I'm gonna, something I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. Um, uh, which is why you're doing all this. Um, but the goal of the patents is to increase the value of your company, right? A patent litigation, I have a patent litigation going on right now and it was filed in the fall of 2016, all right? It's still going, it'll be maybe another year, right? It's expensive, it costs millions of dollars. So if you're a startup, 
and you're trying to produce a product and you turn into a, pro a patent enforcement company, then um, you're, you're, you're a patent enforcement company, no longer a startup, all right? And uh, the goal of, because it's such an expensive product, it's gonna take over your whole life, right? And there's a patent litigation. And so the if an investor asks you how you're gonna protect your market, saying that you have some patents as a three person startup or a patent application um, is not a very strong answer. There's, there's a lot of better ways to express that. Um, more along the lines of we have these features that are better, we're gonna be able to launch at this speed. Um, we have a first mover advantage and once we do this, uh, we're gonna have a viral growth because of blah, blah. Those are all better answers than you can mention the patents, but I, it, in answering that question, what are you going to do about your competition? Who's your competition? Just relying on saying we have a patent application filed is not a strong answer. All right. So patents are for marketing people, not for engineers. Right. So surprise, even though you might associate the patents with engineering, um, I liked, you know, when I did sales and when I did a lot of trade shows and so on. I love to be able to say, we're the only one who has this patented feature and this is why you wanna buy the product, right? Patent, the patent program for your company should be product driven, right? And it should be focused on increasing the valuation of your company so that the next time you raise money, right? Or the next time you go into a sales pitch to some, to some big company, you can say, Here's these four features that make our company number one and why you wanna buy us or why you wanna invest in us or on your exit when you're talking to, to Google or, or Monsanto or Motorola, you can say, you wanna buy us because you know, our product is, number, is best because of A, B and C. And by the way, here's our patents total applications and patent issued patent portfolio totally covering A, B, C and D that, that make us so great. So the sales points, the reasons that people buy your products, the things that your sales and marketing people say, that's what you want to have patents on, right? Those features. So when I sit down with, with a couple of founders, I say to them, why do people want to buy a product? What is it that's going to make you different? If I'm lucky, both founders will say the same thing, but most of the time there's they're not quite aligned and that's a whole different problem, right? So you'll, we, what we do is we identify those things that really are gonna differentiate the product services. And then we look at the underlying technology under those and say, okay, these inventions, these developments, these things we've built are what enable those features. That's what we're gonna file our patent on. So on okay? um, the, the example I talked to you about earlier about Polycom's speakerphone, the triangular shaped phone, they filed a bunch of, patents, the founders of Polycom were two electrical engineers, and they filed a bunch of patents on electrical circuitry and the way the phone worked. It turned out that what made that phone successful was the big sound. The speaker in the middle pointed up, and then the, a series of microphones around the outside so that no matter where people were, they were picked up well by the microphones. They didn't patent that the a, a system where the, the speaker was positioned that way and the microphones are distributed. That way. They focused on engineering stuff uh, about noise filters and muxes and how to do duplex communications, right? And those patents didn't turn out to be as important. Kind of, it's just my opinion, but their design patent on the shape of the phone turned out to be one of their more valuable patents. It would have been great if they had patented the speaker orientation in the middle and the microphones pointed out. That, that would have been better because that's really the big sound feature of that phone and how well and clean it was, was in part due to the technology of how those, those features were arranged on the actual device, okay? So it's gotta be product driven. Your goal is to develop as a, if you're an early state startup, your goal is to develop an IP portfolio, including patents and other things that increase the valuation of your company so that every time you get money, I'm repeating this, I know, Every time you get money, you can argue for a better valuation. My goal as a patent attorney is that every time you run money, I've paid for myself many times over. 
prove that, but really success, very successful cases where a company was an acquirer was looking at several different companies to be bought. And, you know, one of them, my client was bought for hundreds of millions of dollars and the other one closed their doors two weeks later, right? There was only going to be one purchase and the winner got the money. And I, my goal is to make sure that the IP portfolio makes a difference in that decision, right? Okay, so IP should be more than just a checkbox. When you're doing your A round presentation and raising $20 million, I like to give my clients a, a, a PowerPoint slide that shows a graph of bubbles with those three or four core features about their product in the middle. And then around those features are, are other bubbles with all their patents and patent applications with all this crisscross of lines in front of it, right? Making it look really messy, okay? And we call that a cluster map. And the more lines and the, the more cluster it looks, it really conveys to the investor like, oh, the cool features I just heard about are really well covered by this patent app, like by all this patent portfolio. It means something. That is a lot better in my point of view than a little checkbox on a list of other things that, in, in their presentation. Anyway, moving on, where, I don't know, where are we on time here? Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, the last point I had in terms of mistakes, uh, what time is it? Haha, <laughs> okay. Uh, the last point I had, uh, uh, which was about mistakes was not understanding the patent. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now, some technical stuff. And I'm, I'm gonna to present to you slides that you're not gonna be able to read completely, right? Because I'm gonna show actual patents. But I'm gonna to try to explain what the different parts of the patents are so that you as either an engineer or an officer in a company or a founder or something, have a little bit better understanding of the anatomy of a patent, all right? So, there's a couple of parts. There's a, a the first section of the patent is includes a bunch of data, right? And it's the filing date, the num, and I'm going to show all these examples in a minute. All right, it's just is uh, what you might call the metadata about the patent, right? And then there's a big written spec document that's called the specification, and that really includes figures. There's drawings. I hope everybody can recognize the figures, right? And then there's something called claims, and we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between the specification and the claim. All right, so here we go. Ready, fasten your seatbelts. Here's the first, first example. Ah, uh, the data. All right, this is a um, patent application and it is uh, by a bunch of inventors. Brad Falkins is the lead inventor. And this patent happens to be on uh, image processing. CloudSight publishes an app that goes on your phone, iPhone. Uh, and it allows you to uh, point the phone at something, it'll tell you what it is. Like an ugly spider, it'll tell you what the spider is. Uh, a bag, uh, you know, some designer bag, it'll tell you the name of the bag. Uh, it is actually um, a built-in feature for handic uh, disabled people in Samsung devices. So if you, there's a product called Tap Tap C that allows blind people to point their phone and stuff and it'll, it'll verbally tell them what it is. And it's pretty cool. This is a, a great app, by the way, you can, um, it can run on the phone. So you don't have to be connected to the internet. And it basically, you can run it around a room and it'll identify one thing after another with a really cool description, like a, a boy with towel on beach, right? With a, some a, a descriptor rather than just a, a single word. Anyway, let's get to here. So the assignee, so these inventors assigned this application when it was an application to CloudSight Inc., who is the now the current, still the current owner. This is the application number. So when app patents are filed, they have an initial application number, and this is the filing date. Up here is important. I want, I get a lot of this issue, right? This says patent number. And it gives something that's in the 9 million range. Now we're in the 10 millions, right? 10 million, 800,000 or something. So um, if it says here pub, short for publication number, that is not an issued patent. That's a patent application publication, right? That's still being examined. So what happens sometimes is that people come running up to me and go, oh my God, I saw this patent. It, it was covered everything. How can they? 
possibly do this? But, and I look at it and said, this isn't an issued patent, it's a publication that, and it might be an application that's already dead and abandoned, right? There's more published patent applications than there are issued patents, I think at this point, right? That are enforced, okay? So up here, you wanna see patent number. If it's pub number, what you see could have changed, right? In the patent prosecution process, claims get amended and so on. So you actually have to go to the patent office website and look up the status of that application. And if it's published, you can you can do that, right? So, oops. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out here is a priority data, okay? This patent application is one of a family. So there's a whole bunch of other applications here dating back uh, and the dates here go to, I cut it off, but it goes to May 1st, 2013. So the priority of this application, which was filed in May of 2017, goes back at least to some extent to May 2013. Now, not all of the content may have been in that original, this is a number for a provisional, this 61, 60 or 61 or 62, this is a provisional application. And this number was, it starts with 14, 15, or 16, and you know, it'll grow over time. Those are non-provisional patent applications. So this application claimed benefit to all these, and the priority goes back. So it's part one of a family, right? Um, there's a law firm that this was uh, Royce Law Firm, which I used to work at, um, where this issued from. And uh, that's, that's the main... In important information here on the front page, right? Um, let's see, let's go past the data. Figures, I hope you can recognize the figures. They're the drawings, right? This is a very simple block diagram of a, of a computing device. Uh, in one embodiment, this could be a iPhone, right? It has a camera, has an IO and memory and tracking and all kinds of different logic. So in the specification, which we're gonna see next, I will, refer back to the figure and refer to these different items. So somewhere in the specification, I refer to camera 910 and I describe all about the features of camera what, not 910 and what that really means, okay? All right, so this is the specification. Now this can go really long, all right? Um, this is a description of related applications. So I can see that this is related to all these things is back May 1st, 2013 again. Um, and then there's a background section, right? And somewhere it'll say brief description of the drawings and a, perhaps a summary. And then somewhere it should say detailed description. And when it gets to detailed description, that's the description that the inventor, the applicant is put into their patent application. The description can cover lots of stuff. I've seen patent applications that are hundreds of pages long, or patents that are hundreds of pages long. The description can talk about, oh, let's give an example. Let's say it's a rocket ship. I'm winging this example, so we all see how well it blasts off, okay. Um, there could be some writings about the gyroscopes. There could be some writings about the, the fins at the bottom, or the propellant tank coatings, or how the different stages, a release mechanism in the different stages, or anti-lock brakes, right? Some new type of rocket ship that has anti-lock brakes. Who knows? It could have all kinds of stuff in it, all right? And some of that stuff's gonna be old. I mean, they might talk about, um, you know, having a first, second, and third stage, right? In their rocket ship, which has been around for a little while, right? For, you, for those of you who remember rockets, right? So um, the description can talk about lots of different things, all right? But the invention that's claimed in the patent is defined by the claims, not by the description. Right? So for you to see, I'm speaking slowly because I'm hoping this will get into the neurons, right? For you to understand what the patent really covers, you have to look at the claims. Right? It's the purpose of this description to explain what the claims mean and to convey to the world what the invention really is and all the details and, and, and fine tune it. And the description is supposed to have enough information in it for one of ordinary skill in the art to be able to reproduce the invention, right? So you have to really enable, you have to describe a lot. 
you can't have a patent issued on a Star Trek transporter where there's a long description and then it says a miracle happens and another long description that doesn't fly. Okay, just from, you actually have to know and be able to explain how to do something. Right? So the claims look like this. Okay, and this is the first claim of that. Oh, let me jump back for just one second. So in a patent, you will see two columns with col line numbers in between, all right? And people refer to column two lines five to 10 if they wanna to refer to certain text. In a patent application publication, you will see paragraph numbers here at the head of every paragraph. So when I pick up a document, I can, I don't have to look at the front cover, I can look at it and I can say, oh, this is a patent application publication. There are you know, numbered paragraphs. That's one easy way to tell in, in the US, right? Okay, jumping back. This is a claim. So what the owner of this patent claims is their invention is described here from in this paragraph number one. It's called claim one, all right? And it's a method of processing an image, including one, two, three, four, five steps, right? Okay. So they claim to infringe this patent, you would have to have a method of doing this that included all five of the steps. If somebody didn't do this comparison step here, comparing the image descriptors, then what they were doing wouldn't be covered by this patent, okay? So the more stuff, the more words here the, this claim has, the more things there are for somebody to satisfy in order to infringe the patent. A patent claim that's two columns long is almost certainly worthless, right? Because you, uh, somebody would have to do every single thing mentioned in those two columns in order to infringe that. A really broad patent claim w might have just two or three lines, right? Um, and, Unless it's like a chemical, a, uh, a patent on a, chem a chemical compound where it could just have like, you know, a formula, right? That would be short, but that's chemistry. So for here's, we're talking about software. The more stuff, the more words here, the narrower the claim is, right? So when you're trying to get a patent, you would like to have as few, the, each of these things are referred to as limitations. You'd like to have as few limitations, right? Okay, so here's a limitation processor of the portable device. It's a portable device. It's not a um, desktop machine, okay? A server in a rack, right? Um, you, you're comparing image descriptors, not just the images, right? So these are all these words really count and you have to understand. To understand this claim, you may have to go back or very likely you have to go read through all the specification and see what they talk about when they talk, they, if they have a discussion, they should, about a step of deriving image descriptors. Somewhere in, in the figures of this patent, there's a flow chart that, that has a step deriving image descriptors step so-and-so, right? And if the patent's written well. So this is the first claim. It's called an independent claim because it doesn't reference any others. The second claim here is a, called a dependent claim because it refers back to claim one and then adds a further limitation where in the stored set of image descriptors are store, stored, sorry, in memory of the portable device. This is obviously my typo, okay. So um, this adds a further limitation, which narrows the scope of what would be in, infringed, okay? So dependent claims narrow things down. So now we're gonna step back a, a step and I'm trying to look at how much time we have, okay? Um, I'm going to talk for about five more minutes and then I'm going to start answering questions. So uh, the specification again can talk about lots of stuff. And it could be that there's two or three paragraphs in that 30 page document, a 40 page document, where a specific set of claims is really directed. So a, a particular patent could have lots of detailed description, but you have to look at the claim, see what the claim is saying to figure out what the scope of the patent is. This is one reason why patents can have families, right? So you can have a bunch of different related patents, some which are daughters of others and so on. And it means that there was a lot of, dis a lot of invention described in the specification 
and the, the applicant has gone after a set of claims on one particular invention and then a set of claims on a different invention that's also in the same description. And I have seen cases where there's, you know, five, six dozen related applications easily, right? So uh, a really thorough, good patent description, a specification has lots of inventions and possible claims that come out of it. All right, so that's um, a little bit about the anatomy of a patent and really to sit down when you see something that's, I mean, as I said, I get people coming to me that say, oh my God, this patent. And I say to them, that's, all, that's just a publication and it was abandoned a year ago, right? So um, get it, getting to know what these really mean and having the idea that uh, fewer words make a broad claim, which means that it would cover more, but it's also more likely to be invalidated by prior art. If somebody's gonna attack your patent, they're gonna search for a piece of prior art. And if they can find something with an earlier date than your patent that includes everything in your claim, that can kill your claim. That's what called, is called anticipating the claim. Your claim has to have at least one thing new or either new or not obvious to include together with everything else. So that's what that's what could make something patentable and would get somebody a patent. So the more words you have, the easier it is to get the patent. The fewer words you have, the broader the claim you have. Getting a balance is a trick. So dependent claims further narrow more broad dependent claims. And that kind of gives you a scope um, in, in meaning that if a patent's ever enforced, some claims may survive and others might not. Okay, so I'm now gonna move on since we're really close to out of time. Uh, why would we do this? Okay, we've already talked about valuation, all right? Uh, you're, if you're a, a little early stage startup, you don't have much of a budget, okay? Uh, but you, patents will really help you fight with play with the big guys and it could really make a difference in the valuation of your company, all right? And we've talked about it, it's the value. So how can you get a budget? Provisional applications are a good way to start. There are books on filing provisional applications and they are um, useful. You can use a patent attorney, which I believe is helpful. I have done, before I was a patent attorney or patent agent, I worked with patent attorneys and I did some patent applications myself when I was in industry. Uh, it's My advice is spend a little bit of money with a patent attorney um, and that will give you something that's more likely to really be of value in the future. Um, let's, uh, you know, the goal of doing this, of course, is that, you know, eventually, uh, if you have an IP portfolio, it could make you richer. Yay, everybody like that? Applause? Okay, good, yes. We're fine. Let's talk a little bit about the initial costs, all right? So I'm gonna present you a slide that shows typically what I charge for a provisional patent application helping a client get a provisional patent application, and then give you some numbers that are really broadly ballpark, right? Because it really depends on how broad your patent, you know, if you fight really hard for a broad patent or if you're in a really crowded space, um, you know, how aggressive you wanna be, it really depends. But here's some sample numbers just to give you an idea, right? All right, so provisional patent application, I do, a deal with people where I will help them write a provisional patent application and it costs about $2,000. Uh, and that's a strict budget total cost, right? And what happens is I will sit down with them for an hour or two, talk about what to pat patent, what to cover. I will write claims for them. I will maybe do some drawings. They're simple block diagrams or easy figures, right? Or maybe I'll use a CAD drawing that they have. Um, and then I'll give them an outline and tell, and tell them to go fill this in right? And tell me the detail of every, you know, every detail, every line in my outline should be one or two paragraphs. I want you to write a 20 or 30 page paper, right? And it's a lot cheaper because the 20 or 30 hours of work it takes to write that much is being done by the applicant and the inventors rather than an expensive patent attorney. So that's an approach. I will give you feedback and do drafts and something like that. Generally, you can you know, this is the type of budget, $2,000, that would be reasonable to get a, a provisional patent application on file, including the filing fee, 
assuming you're a small entity, a small company. So that gives you an idea. Hopefully, if you're trying to start a company, you have that type of money because if you don't have at least some money in the bank, you're going to need, um, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, it's good to have a cushion of money. Otherwise, the first investor that comes along will drag you out and have you over a barrel and then, you know, really force you to agree to terms you don't want. You don't want to be um, going looking for investment when you're desperate to pay your rent, okay? which happens, right? So I charge 2000 for doing that type of provisional. I have seen people who come to me with a, a paper ready for a scientific publication. That's much cheaper, right? Under 500, it's, it's easy for me to put together. Um, so those are initial prices. Now I've put down to get a non-provisional application about $18,000. That's a pretty good size patent application, including about 800 to $900 in filing fees at the patent office. Um, it really depends on the size and how much detail. The more that's in the application, the more valuable it's gonna be, right? And so the longer it is, the more expensive it's gonna be. I picked 18,000, that's a typical number. Um, the pink line, which is below, is for a family member, in other words, a related patent application. So you might have an existing application and have a new related invention. What we'll do is take the specification, right? You know what a specification is now, right? We'll take that earlier specification, add a bunch more pages to it, right? Maybe just 10, five to 10 more pages and that disclose a new invention and we'll file that. That's much less expensive, right? Uh, I, I have looked at clients of mine that have, you know, dozens of patents that have issued and looked at the cost of when, you know, just to get, this is to get things on file. Uh, the average drops to about nine to $12,000. Uh, you know, the, the key patents, the new big new ones are more like 18. Um, I've seen them above 20 easily. Uh, I've seen them, you know, that number really varies from 15 to 20 easily. Uh, it, but it depends on, you know, your budget, right? You should, with a patent attorney, be able to sit down and say, here is a budget for this, right? It's not like litigation where there can be a lot of unknowns jumping up at you. Uh, uh, it should be pretty easy to plan a, a startup budget, all right? So after it's on file, there some years go by, the patent office almost always rejects on the first pass. And then your patent attorney has to explain to the patent examiner why they're wrong or why they're right. And uh, that back and forth costs money. It can happen quite a few times. It can go to appeal. It can, depends on how much you want to fight. Uh, but, you know, over four or five years, you might spend to get an issued patent $30,000. That's not surprising for, for a key fun, foundational patent. Uh, for other family members, it might be more like $20,000. Uh, but that's just to give you an idea of it will vary considerably for every patent, right? This is to give you an idea of what the costs will be over years. If you're doing an early stage startup and you're raising money, it's not unusual. I'm in Silicon Valley, right? So a Silicon Valley startup that's gonna get VC money after getting angel money might put thirty-five dollars to $50,000 in their first year after funding for IP, which would include a few patent applications and maybe a trademark or something like that. That's just to give you, an investor will nod at that number and go, okay, that makes that makes sense, right? Okay, that was patent costs and I hope that that was useful for you. Um, this is my contact information. You're welcome to contact me. That's my direct line. This is my LinkedIn, please reach out there. You can follow me, I have lots of followers. Um, I keep updating this number. Ramon Law is um, probably in 13 countries at least now, uh, we're about, a we are a semi-virtual law firm, which means I spend most of my time uh, near Lake Tahoe. <laughs> and most of our attorneys work from home. We do have offices, including in San Francisco Bay Area, San Francisco and Menlo Park and Palo Alto. But um, most offices tend to be more staff and conference rooms and stuff like that. So most attorneys uh, work outside. Uh, because of this, we're a very cost-efficient law firm. Uh, in total, we're a little bit over 150 attorneys at this point, I think. Um, and this number I keep, I just updated it again today because I know we're at least 38 offices. So now I'm going to lean over here and I've got a little button that says Q&A. 
And, and, and I know Rob is probably going, well, when are you going to finish this? Okay, so I will um, talk for at least 10 or 15 more minutes. I like the questions. So, um, so how do you search for, uh, I'm going to go now through uh, the question, which are over on my screen here. Okay. And try to answer them the best I can. And Ryan is asking, how do I search for a trademark name? So you can, there's two things to do. You can look, uh, go to uspto.gov. And there is a link there for trademarks and a bunch of different ways you can search. Uh, the difficulty in trademarks is that sound alikes count. In other words, you can't say Amazon uh, with a little bit different spelling and try to, to get around Amazon's trademark, right? So you have to try all kinds of different spellings. You have to try different word languages. Um, but initially, if you're going to start a company, I you know, I would do a Google search to see what comes up. I do a LinkedIn search, see if there's companies that are on LinkedIn. I would do the patent offices, uh, patent and trademark search. I do, um, yeah, that's those are kind of the core. And if you hit Google and everything else, that should show you stuff. But again, you have to look at all the different spelling variations in all the different languages. <coughs> Sorry, hold on. And so you're going to have, um, uh, there's a lot of work to do, uh, but do an initial search on your own and then go to a trademark attorney and say, you know, can you, why don't you have one of your searchers and the, the trademark attorney himself or herself won't do it. They'll, they have somebody who's a professional searcher for, you know, 500, $800 will do a, a search for you. Um, and Mr. Anonymous, who is my regular attendee, He's always here, or she's always here. Thank you very much. Um, and she's asking, why isn't there a single patent system for all countries in the world, trade organization? Wouldn't it be simply and better for everyone? Yeah, it could be simpler and better for everyone, but uh, patents are um, a matter of federal law in the United States. Um, they're also a matter of, you know, every country has its own set of laws. And the patent laws in different countries actually do vary quite a bit. So for instance, in the United States, we have this rule that if you, if you do a public disclosure, you have one year to file your patent application, but in the rest of the world, you don't have that one year buffer. So it's a big difference. Um, in Germany, if you are a big company like Monsanto and you have a chemist who invents something by statute and law, you have to pay that inventor certain amounts of money for the life of that patent. And a PhD scientist in Mons at, in, at Bayer in Germany, you know, 30%, 20, 30% of his income when he retires might be patent. That's a law that came from, um, you know, the 1930s and 40s in Germany, which is nowhere else in the world. Um, the laws are really different. Uh, it can be quite a bit different. First to file ownership, um, there is a system called the uh, PCT, the Patent Cooperation Treaty, where you can file um, an application and then 18 months later decide which countries to go in to. So you don't have to make, if you file a provisional application, you have one year then to file what's the PCT application or the and then 18 more. So you have 30 or some cases 31 more months between your initial filing and what figuring out what countries you have to go into. And hopefully by then your, your startup has gotten to the point where you can pick a few. Um, the other thing that's really different different countries is enforcement. You know? And I'm not even gonna go there. Okay, Julie has a question. If a presentation is given via Zoom, Skype, et cetera, is that public use? Um, it depends. Uh, I would assume, well, 20 years ago, there was a court that said uh, an anonymous, F a random FTP address, oh, that's fire transfer protocol, or, right? Or what we would use for an IP address today that nobody would have guessed and it was 10 digits or something. Well, that was public because there was no, and, and nowadays we wouldn't, so, the rule has changed, right? Well, is what I'm trying to say. Um, do you use, was there a, if it was a presentation between internal to your company and you used a password protected uh, 
you know, an ID code for your Zoom meeting, that's certainly confidential, right? Because there's an assumption that nobody is going outside of it. Um, it's very hard to get investors to sign uh, non-disclosure agreements and generally they will not because they see so many ideas, there's no way. Every idea they've seen, they've probably seen something really close to it by now. Um, if you're at a conference, um, there, that's public. If you're in a meeting where there's a, an assumption of conf, con, confidentiality, like if you go, then there's an, that's not a public, usually a public disclosure. Um, so a private VC meeting would not be a public disclosure, right? There's an assumption that, and you will establish that in your conversation, we'd like you to keep this confidential. That's all you need. They're not gonna sign anything, but you should say, this is confidential, right? There's an assumption of confidentiality. Then it is, you have a, a, a good argument that it was not a public disclosure. If you have a, an event where anybody can attend, that's probably public, right? So there's a fine line. There's also some experimental use exceptions. If you have some new drone technology and you take it out to the Mojave Desert on a cool day, right? Uh, and fly it around, uh, making sure that nobody's around, that's probably not public, right? Um, anyway, it, it really matters in this specific case, but uh, yeah, try to file first. Okay, now we have another, um, somebody's asking if a provisional patent application is made public after a certain amount of time. It is if it's claimed in a non-provisional and that non-provisional is made public, right? But it's not indexed. So if you do a Google search on patents as it stands right now, they don't look at the provisional applications. They only look at the, at the published applications. You'd actually have to look at the published, then dig in and go to the patent office and access the provisional. And who knows what's in there? It could be very, I've seen provisional applications that have very little to do with, you know. Anyway, um, somebody's asking if, some, if a company needs only one patent for all of the EU, for the European Union. Um, so a couple of points, they don't. Um, they can have one patent application and they go through the approval process and the allowance process. And after it's allowed, then, they can say, oh, I, can, I, I want this one in Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, right? And the EU is a different group, a slightly different group than uh, the European Patent Office, all right? So the UK is part, not part of the EU, but it is part, and Switzerland is another case. So there's a couple of countries that are part of that patent group that aren't part of that regional group that aren't part of the EU. There's also a regional group in Africa, um, so those are available to you, but that really saves a lot of money. Next question is from Ryan. Um, yeah, so Ryan is asking about consultants who work from a shared, from a development center, and they likely had um, code that they could have reused for competitors and now are reusing for this for Ryan's company. Yeah, that could be a problem. So, you know, somebody does a search on your code and finds that the same, you know, signatures uh, of the compiled versions are found there. It's like, wait, we paid this somebody to develop this three years ago, it's ours. It can be a problem and you, so, the development center you contract with should be a really reputable one. Um, and th your agreement with them should specifically address this issue. Um, I know so, uh, there's one in India called Persistent Systems. It's got a huge reputation that does work for all the, you know, for Microsoft and Google and all the big names. So there's some really good development houses there. Um, but yeah, you need to find ones that you can trust. Right? I've used, um, actually, have used people in Russia, but they're actually they're people who we have friends and we I know people in common. I've used Fiverr, um, but only for things like graphics and drawings and um, you know 
fun things like that. Never for um, code that's going to go into a product. Uh, so you you definitely need to make sure that your agreement with the developer has IP clauses and they've signed off on this, right? Because it could be a problem. Um, where could one read about what can be protected by industry and sector? This is a question of what's patentable and what's not. It is probably best, the best approach is to talk to a patent attorney um, with and talk about your specific project and your specific product or service. Um, rather than look trying to look at everything and narrow it down, look at what you have. Um, there's products of nature aren't patentable, but purified things are potentially. Straight algorithms, you know, a, a uh, sorting algorithm or compression algorithm isn't, um, but a computer system that has a, a, a new encryption algorithm that, that's both not just the algorithm, but the computing device itself, that could be patentable, right? So there's a really fine line and it's something in some areas where there's a lot of argument. You probably have less luck with something that where you're just calculating a risk. So if you're, you have a piece of software that calculates the risk on a financial instrument, like an option, mm, good luck. That's gonna be really hard. If you have a piece of software that creates a technical effect, in Europe, the standard is, does it or doesn't it not create some technical effect? Um, and I also write to that because it's, a, it's better than the US standard, which has been changing over the years. So a technical effect could be sorting of data you know, accessing specific data, changing an image, um, generating metadata or summary regarding something, uh, you know, lifting an object with a robot. Those are all technical effects, right? So it depends. It, this is really a case by case. I haven't answered your question because I'd have to look at what you have to really answer it properly. Um, Somebody, Miss, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Virtual says, I wasn't able to join the webinar until 12.30. Would you please email me the presentation? Yes, thanks. So a copy, a link to the recording will go out. Um, my admin's coming back from her vacation on the 13th, so it'll probably be in the week after that. Um, it'll also be available on YouTube through Idea to IPO, and it'll probably be there sooner. Um, so Kathleen is asking, what's the timeline for a provisional patent? Well, it lasts for one year, but to get it on file depends. Um, if it's a business plan that you've already written, it probably can be done. I mean, the amount of work is less than an hour. So, right, you gotta engage a patent attorney, <laughs> um, get them to fill out a two page form, slap it on top of your document and file it. Uh, it could be done next day if the timing's right, but nobody's going to ever guarantee you that. Um, if you're going to do a process where we go back and forth and actually do some writing, it takes me about a week or two, depending on how busy I am, to get you back an outline and something for you to start writing. Very often, founders will um, say they're going to write 20 to 30 pages and come back with three. <laughs> so it's... Um, yeah, so then it's a matter of how good you are at writing, right? Uh, and how easy that is for you and your team. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Anonymous, uh, or Dr. Anonymous says, are most patents intentionally written to be difficult to understand? Um, sometimes, rarely though, I mean, sometimes people will use words that are not quite as one would expect, and that can hide something, but it's, it's, a, it's a messy game, and I don't think it's done very often. The reason they sound so verbose and so wordy is people are trying to use this extremely exact language uh, or list every single possibility that they can come up with. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll uh, a phrase that I always use in my applications is logic. And I'll have a sentence that says, as used here in the term logic refers to hardware, firmware, or software stored on a non-transient computable readial, readable medium, uh, sometimes excluding paper. And then there will be a paragraph that describes every type of memory that I can think of, right, from computer memory. Um, 
that's all there. So for various, oh, those words are there for various reasons because of issues that have happened in, in patent law in the past. Um, I try, you know, giving different embodiments. It's it's really hard to write. A, a, when I was in, um, uh, I, I know I don't have time, but uh, give me a couple of minutes. In college, I took an economics class and I remember the teacher uh, talking about legislation. And what he did was he had everybody write down uh, a description of how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich, right? And so, you know, this is a freshman class. So there's 70, 60 people in it. I went to a small college, but right. So, um, and so then he starts going through the examples and he's got a can of peanut butter, a can of jelly, some bread and a bunch of utensils, right? And he, he literally word for word follows what people have done. And by the time he's done, there's like peanut butter and jelly everywhere. You know, he, you know and, and, and put, you know, it'll say, put the, the jelly covered piece aside and he's tossed it into the first row, right? Or you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to write an exact description of something, especially claims. And so it takes about 10 years for a patent attorney to get really good at writing claims. Uh, and writing, so it, it gets hard to read. I hate reading patents. I can write them, but it's the most boring thing. Okay, I know uh, Rob is probably going, you've got four minutes, okay. Um, there's a comic strip, I'm now gonna really go off here. Um, Calvin and Hobbes, and uh, if you anybody remember that comic strip, Calvin's dad is a patent attorney. And there are episodes about being a patent assert attorney there. And he reads that to Calvin to put him to sleep. And, and I think that's probably a really good definition of patents. So uh, that's the best answer I can give you. Um, so somebody's asking, is there image recognition on a mobile device that's not covered by the patent you showed? Why is this patent not considered obvious? So there was a lot more detail to that patent that I showed. It's more than just image recognition. Um, and I don't remember that particular one, what made that one different um, for that client. Some of them, the really useful logic was that the technology would look at, do an a, a initial recognition on the image and then decide if the computer could handle it or not. And it, if not, it would be sent to a call center in the Philippines and a human would actually type it in. And then it would, they could do that just about as fast as a server could. And one point it was getting, the, it, the price was about the same for the company. So that company has about 750 million tagged images, properly tagged images. So one of their biggest values is that database. Um, but yeah, there were the details of that, of each of those languages really distinguish it from all, that company has been around for a while, but it was enough to distinguish from what been, has been done before. That, that's a mistake is you look at a claim like that and says, oh, what they're doing here is recognizing images, but the devil's in the details. And there's some wording or some limitation in there that distinguished them from and made them non-obvious over the prior art. That company has quite a few patents, but they're not all directed at what you would call normal image recognition, right? They're directed at other things related, right? Okay. Um, thanks, Stephen. Okay, Ali. Somebody's talking about having a, they have a granted patent, which I hope is not an issued patent. Once a patent issues, you can not no longer file continuations or daughter applications from it. So you have to do it before the issue date. Um, so he, he, Ali is describing a situation where they have something that's been granted and now considering continuations. It's probably most economically efficient to just add material to that specification right, be it five or 10 pages or whatever you need, and then file that as the daughter application because you get to reuse all that text in the specification and that saves, drives the cost down tremendously. That's the strategy that I typically do. Um, for companies that have existing portfolios, we would use a provisional application in a case, and I, and I know that my time's up, but we'd use a provisional application in a case where uh, it's an idea they had, but they're not sure if they're gonna put it in their product. They don't wanna invest 
a large amount of money in it yet, but a year later they might find that it's important or useful. So a new idea comes along and, okay, we're gonna put that in, in a release you know, 10 months from now. Uh, let's cover that just now with a provisional because uh, it may be that we change our mind, right? And you don't want to invest, you know, 10,000 or $15,000 in, in that application when it might not be something that you might change your mind. In early stage startups pivot a lot. Another advantage to provisionals is uh, if, a, if, a, if a company turns 90 degrees and goes in a different direction, you haven't spent 30 grand on, on non-provisional patent applications uh, that, that's painfully lost, right? Okay, going on. Um, is doing something on a mobile device, this is Dr. Anonymous, uh, is somebody doing something on a mobile device that is previously done on a server considered to be non-obvious invention? It depends <laughs> on the details. What did you have to do different to get it to work on a mobile device? So if I were doing an invention disclosure with you, I'd say, okay, this looks like it's been done before. You didn't, I'm, did you just take the exact same code and do it on a mobile device? Because mobile devices are now powerful enough to handle that. Mm, that's not going to fly, right? It, but my bet is you tweaked it and you made some changes. And that's where we would look for patentable subject matter. It's, it's um, even when you take two existing things and try to merge them together to make something new, it could be obvious, but that this and this would provide together to provide benefits. But if, 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 if in, in hooking them together, you had to create some sort of link or connection or some, some new feature, right? That might be the thing that's distinguishing, the, the non-obvious part, that linkage. So when I have people bringing stuff together, it's like, okay. Uh, analogy I haven't yet used in this presentation is the sewing machine. Okay, one minute more, I promise. Um, it had the bobbin, you know, the manual sewing. It had the tread, the, the terrandol that you step on, but it also had the needle with the hole at the pointy end. Nobody in their right mind would put the hole of the needle on the pointy end. You always put it on the fat end, right? When you sewed. But on a sewing machine, it has to be on the pointed end. Was that obvious? Probably not before the sewing machine. But it, once you realize the problem, once you see a problem, sometimes it's the identification of the problem that's the, really the invention. And once you've identified the problem, then, oh, here's three different solutions. What should we do? All right. That's a cool way of discovering a new problem. Like I, I want an automated machine to do the sewing. How do I build that? That's the problem. And you end up with a needle with a hole at the pointed end, which could have been a great patent claim someday. In fact. Um, Okay, uh, really quickly, I'm only gonna answer one more question. And Jeff is asking me, what, is that true to write minimal for, writing minimal for field of men? Uh, I think Jeff is asking me about, is it good to say a minimal amount in the, in the sections of the patent that say field of invention, summary and background? I like to see a minimal amount in the background. Because if you, you know, define some things there as you're gonna live with the definitions or say, you, know, it, you don't need a background um, and it can definitely be used against you. So I do not like to, a background that goes on and gone, especially don't like one that cites a whole bunch of IP and talks about what somebody's done and somebody else has done. Oh, that's all real bad. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so there's a few more questions here and I will uh, uh, ask the people who haven't answered questions um, to contact me directly because it's been over an hour and a half. And while I really enjoy this, um, I have to go on to my next thing and please attend the next time. And for all I see, probably four or five more questions that uh, just send me an email at the email address on the screen and I'd be happy to answer it for you. Thank you very much and have a good day.